Hello, everybody. Welcome back to It's a Twin Thing. It we guys, I cannot talk today. I cut my finger. <gasps> oh, no. oh no! Your one little cut on your finger compared to my dry, yeah, crackly, just... bleeding hands. I'm sorry. You need to get yourself some working hands cream. I know. I'm doing research on the best hand cream because I just am not sure that working hands works as well for me as it does for you, and I mm. need the top notch. I mean, my gingerbread scented Big Lots hand cream that I have right now, I'm pretty sure is doing wonders for my skin, but it smells pretty really sure. good. I have apple scented hand soap that smells really good. Oh, I have fall scented hand soap that I was going to get out next time we ran out and we just ran out of soap this oh, morning. Oh, you should get some hands I'm out. going to. My roommate also has, don't tell anyone because you're not really supposed to have candles in our apartment, but... My roommate has a pumpkin scented candle that she like lights every night and mm. it, she blows out before she goes to sleep. Yeah. But it smells so good. We are allowed to have candles and my roommate you always. You are? Uh-huh. Can I get you some candles? Sure. But I also have one of those wall plug-in things and I had a pumpkin spice one that smelled really good. But then when you live in the room, you kind of become nose blind to it. Mm. So I stopped being able to smell it that much, but. It ran out, and I know I have other ones, but they're way on the top of my shelf, and I can't reach them. And I have a step stool, but the box that they're in, it fits, but it doesn't really come down past, like, the wall where the shelf is because it's in my closet. So I can't really get it down, so I'm not sure how I'm going to get to these so I can plug a new one in, but... I've been stressing about it for a couple days I'm now. Sorry, when our parents were here, you should have just had one of them get it down. For well, you. I didn't think about it yeah. because, first of all, they should not have. It would not have been a good idea for them to come into my room because we had the performances of Little Women this week, and it was, it was bad word week. Tech week. Yeah, it was tech week. Um, I was running to classes and then I would run back, do my hair or deal with producer stuff on the computer mm-hmm. and then run to rehearsal or to call time for the show. And I just had clothes and bags and books out everywhere because I was literally never at my apartment except to sleep for like a few hours a night. So it was a little bit of a disaster, but it's becoming better now. Anyway, welcome to Twinspiration. Yay! It's Aspen, the better half of the Summer's Twins. And Ashley, the best half of the Summer's Twins. Before we introduce our guest today, it is time for the inspirational in it. Yay! You know what? You always tell me when we're talking about it, you always say the Good News Minute. You don't call it the right name. Like you said, do you want to read the Good News Minute? No, I said, do you want to read the good news story? Oh. I'm almost sure that's what I said. Well, you should have said, do you want to read the inspirational in it? Well, you're not reading the in it. You're reading the inspirational in it story. What? (laughs) The inspirational in it is the moment. You're not reading it. You're reading the story for it. Okay, okay, okay. Now, are you all ready to hear this after we just argued about it? Um, I'm ready. Okay. This story is about... A woman in Britain named Lizzie Larbolester, except that's probably not how you pronounce it. And she is a volunteer for the British Divers Marine Life Rescue. And this woman, all by herself, spent nine months turning her Airbnb into a makeshift animal hospital where she took care of injured seals. And then after deciding that they didn't have enough space for all of the seals that they wanted to take care of, She and her husband gathered some volunteers and they built a complete animal hospital from the ground up in Cornwall. And they have now taken care of over a thousand seals and brought them back to health so that they could be rehabilitated into the ocean, which is just such an amazing story that one person, I mean, obviously with the help of other people, but pretty much one person did all of this on her own and built an entire hospital from the ground up and saved so many animals lives. Yeah, I picked that story because I really loved it that she did it completely out of the goodness of her heart and wanting to make a difference and wanting to help these animals and seals are my favorite animal. I love them. I think they're so cute. I'm sorry that I read it since seals are your favorite animal. It's okay. Do you want to re-record it? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, today we had a very unique guest on To Inspiration. We have Danny Rosenblad James, who is a travel blogger. She runs the blog Misfit Wanders. And we've never had anybody like her who has a blog or talks about traveling. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to get to hear from her. She talks about why she started the travel blog and why travel is so important. And then we get to hear about her family a little bit and how they've impacted her traveling as well as how she overcame and dealt with a traumatic brain injury. It was a really cool and interesting interview and it was really fun to get to talk to her. So we hope that you guys enjoy Danny Rosenblad James. How is your day going? Good. Very, very tired. I have a three-year-old, so. Makes sense. Mm. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I know it's late there, so we'll try to not take up too much of your time, but we're excited to get to talk to you and really appreciate you being available last minute to do this interview Mm -hmm. with us. Do you want to just tell us and our listeners a little bit about what Misfit Wanders is and what inspired you to start a travel blog? Okay, this (laughs) was created from my first trip solo out of the country and I went to Peru and Bolivia and I fell in love with learning other cultures having new experiences and all that at first it actually was more like a personal journal online so I didn't have to worry about carrying a book but then now it's turned into what it is now so how old were you when you took your first solo trip out of the country I think I was 23 years old. Oh, wow. And had you always kind of been interested in traveling or was this just like a spur of the moment thing that you did? So I grew up going on a lot of road trips in the States. I have family all over. So the name Misfit Wanders is because I've always felt like a misfit since probably because I've always traveled and been open to more experiences and meeting all kinds of different people, having open minds, I guess I kind of seemed a little bit of a weirdo. (laughs) Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think that a lot of people can probably relate to feeling like a misfit. I know both of us have felt that way. Was travel a way that you kind of found a place to belong? Or how did you, as you were growing up, deal with that? And how have you overcame that? I have always done things out of the norm. I mean, I used to hitchhike for a year on the West Coast. I used to be a weed farmer for five years. And then so I guess it just seemed easy for me to start traveling to other countries and exploring in this way. And were you nervous the first time you went and traveled by yourself? Because I mean, we're 20 and I can't imagine going out of the country all by myself. I feel like I would have a lot of fear about that or anxiety. Was that something that you were nervous about or not really? I mean, I definitely was nervous because I didn't speak Spanish and it's going to a whole nother country to meet my friend who now is my husband. And (sighs) yeah, so what I did is something you should not do. Pay for the first taxi people right out of the airport like or within the airport because they are the most expensive because they know people are going to be a little nervous and maybe scared. (laughs) So they, um, Mm -hmm. their prices are way high. Well, that's good advice. Um, Money saving tip. That's so cool that you met your husband there. Can you tell us more about how you guys met? (laughs) So uh, in Northern Cali, I was a weed farmer there and he got to work beneath me. So that was, that was fun. Mm -hmm. And that's how we met. Um, And then we became good friends. Then he invited me to meet him in Peru. And Mm -hmm. I was a little nervous about it. I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to do it. So then I met him there and we traveled together for like a week or so. And then we went our separate ways. So then I traveled solo and it was only a couple of years ago I learned that he kept going out of his way to keep meeting up with me. I didn't even oh. think that at the time. I'm like, oh, cool. We're going the same way because that seemed to be the common thing at a lot of the hostels I was, I was staying at. People were going like the same route. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, that's like a that. cute story. 
So then since you were going to meet him in Peru, did you know that you wanted to do more traveling or was it kind of just because you were going to meet him and then from that experience you realized that you really enjoyed traveling? Yes, it was from going to Peru that I it sparked something inside me and I was like, wow, I love traveling to other countries, experiencing all this new culture and different people and way of life. That was really awesome. I mean, we went to the Amazons and we stayed in the Amazons for three nights. And every night we had to move our camping site because it was flooding season. So it flooded. And and then since it was flooding season, we learned how to um, fish for fish with machetes. (laughs) And we got eight. So that was pretty cool. Wow, that's cool. I feel like if I was in that situation, I would be like, I'm never doing this again. (laughs) So that's cool that it it was a fun experience for you and made you want to keep doing things Mm -hmm, like that. That sounds like a really special experience that you really got to immerse yourself in the culture. And I know, I think there's a big difference between traveling and experiencing a place versus traveling as a tourist. Drawing that line can be difficult. I mean, I haven't done a lot of traveling in my lifetime, but it's definitely something that I want to do more of. And I know for me, I would like to experience the culture. But like I said, I feel like me and I'm sure a lot of people can relate would have some fear around not speaking the language or not already knowing the culture, not knowing the environment. Do you have any advice for people on how they can really experience the place that they're traveling to and maybe deal with those anxieties? When it comes to those kind of anxieties, I would definitely recommend like The Lonely Planet. That book is amazing. It helps you know good places to eat, places to stay, places to see. And then in the back, it has like a little basic language part where you can learn how to say this or that. And nowadays, since technology is as it is, you can pretty much use Google Translate and just say something in it and then have it translate Mm -hmm. to whatever language if you have reception, I guess. Yeah, that's definitely a good point that technology makes traveling a lot more accessible to people. Speaking of kind of how technology can make traveling easier and more accessible, I think that things like travel vlogs are a great way for people to kind of have more access to knowledge about traveling. So what led you to start the travel vlog? I know you said that Initially, it was just a journal for yourself. Um, But what inspired you to make that something that was public and that you wanted to be available to everybody? I think my why would probably be because I wanted to start inspiring people. I wanted them to get hope and realize that, hey, they can travel too. They just have to push themselves a little bit to get out there at first. And then their world's going to be changed once they do get out there. Can you share any specific memories or experiences where you feel like your world changed from traveling? Maybe a favorite moment or favorite memory? Oh, there's so many. (laughs) I would have to say pretty much the Peru trip in all and in Bolivia. When I was in Bolivia, I went to Potosi and that city is known to have one of the world's worst and most dangerous mine I went Mm -hmm. and explored in there on like a tour so I thought that was really cool learning about all this and then I got to meet their I can't remember what the god's name was they had a statue of the god inside the mountain in the mines they actually have a bunch of them Mm -hmm. so they give offerings to this god to be able to find something or take care of their family or all these things so like they would give tobacco or coca leaves or alcohol oh wow yeah that's really interesting having had so many experiences traveling and seeing other places do you feel like that's helped you grow as a person just being more empathetic or understanding other people I guess what would you say is a value for people in just their development to travel and to go out and see the world 100% it changes the person's perspective on life in general because you see everyone's way of living like um when i was in cambodia and peru and bolivia they're kind of known for maybe being a bit on the poorer side but when you see these people they they don't seem like they're lacking anything they are very happy they're some of the most nicest people i've met 
and they're from the poor countries. It sucks that a country is so judged. And then when you go there, you realize, oh, wait, they're completely different than what people are thinking or something like that. So I definitely think people really should get out there and help them have more of an open mind to the world. Yeah, I think that's such an important point because I know when I was really little, I remember that I just thought America was the best country and every other country was struggling and had so many issues because that was just kind of the narrative that was around me. And obviously, as I grew up, I realized that we weren't this high and mighty country above everybody else. But I think that it can be really easy to have that perspective if you don't get to see other places. It's really cool that you're sharing that message and inspiring people to go and see the world. Going off of that, you so you grew up in South Dakota and now you have lived in Sweden five for years. five years. So what inspired you to move to Sweden and what is it like to live in a different country? Is it something that you ever thought that you would do? So the reason I moved here is because I married a Swede. My husband's a Swedish guy. He did this nice trick. He brought me to Sweden to show me the place around midsummer, so middle end of June. So it's super sunny, nice, everything's alive and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we move here and I get to experience the darkness and the cold and the winter. And it's like, you lied. (laughs) He tricked you. I love it here because they have so much nature. The bad thing is Swedes tend to keep to themselves. So it can be really hard to make friends. But I'm a really outgoing person and Mm -hmm. I just talk to strangers and I don't care. So I've I've made friends, but I've heard a lot of others have had issues. (laughs) And then compared to the U.S., you definitely get the culture shock when you live here. Everyone speaks Swedish, but 90% are uh, fluent in English. So it's pretty easy to get away with just speaking English. Mm -hmm. Um, And you said you have a two-year-old. So what is it like? raising a kid in a different country than where you grew up, especially because you said that there was such a culture shock. Do you feel like kind of the culture around raising children and motherhood is different than it is in America? To be honest, that was a huge reason that we moved here because of their system and how they have it for Mm -hmm. kids here. They have paternity leave, meaning the Mm -hmm. father and the mother have time off. You get paid, I think, around 70% for most of it and then like a third or a fourth of it it's 40 percent or something and then on top of that you're given days to take off from your work if your kid is sick then you're also given Uh i think it's four to five weeks a year of vacation this is a very family friendly country they also pretty much take their kids everywhere um Like any kind of activities, Swedes are known to be very outdoorsy people. No matter the weather, pretty much you can find them outside, the whole family, winter, spring, summer, fall. So that was a huge reason that we finally decided to move here. Have you been able to still travel a lot having a kid? And are you planning on taking your kid around and introducing them to traveling? Or is that kind of something that you're so putting on hold until they're older? To about three to four countries already. So he's been to Norway, oh, wow. Spain, Czech Republic, and oh, wait, France and Belgium. Sorry, five. That's so cool. Does it change your perspective at all to see your child experiencing these places and see it through his eyes? When we were in France, We actually met up with my really good friend and her family, and they're from the States, and they came there. And then we went to Mm -hmm. the dino park. So it's like a park with a bunch of dinosaurs, statues, and all this kind of thing. So that was really fun, going to that with the kids. You maybe aren't seeing all of the things you would like to see. It may be a lot more playgrounds and a lot less things Mm -hmm. because they have to have naps and and all this other stuff. (laughs) but it's still a really fun experience. One thing that you had mentioned to us was that through your blog, you try to inspire people to be more eco-conscious when they travel and guide them in more sustainable traveling experiences. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that kind of became part of your mission and what you're doing to share that message with people? Because I know 
that's not really something that I had ever even thought about until you mentioned it. But I think it is really interesting to consider how when we travel, we can be leaving such an impact. So with many of the places that I love to travel to involves nature. So of course, I'm going to want to have that in my mind when I'm traveling. A lot of the times when we've traveled, we try to take um, local transportation. So like trains is very common for us to take or to see if there are a lot of places we can walk around to and things like that. The the flying thing, I always feel kind of bad about. But now so many of the airlines are getting better and better with being more eco-conscious. You also had mentioned that you have overcome a traumatic brain injury. That, I had to relearn how to walk, how to use my brain. That took about two years before I finally felt like myself again. But I mean, even that, it was like I literally just felt like myself in my body. It wasn't until mm -hmm. like five years or a little bit later where I actually felt healed but yeah, so that that was really tough. It was my husband that was my friend at the time who literally saved me from myself because I'm a bit stubborn and I could only do an hour of work a day, but I didn't I didn't want to have to always give up and not work. So he had to pretty much force me to go to bed every day. And so he would end up watching movies and things with me and trying to keep me away from the fields. <laughs> I mean, only being able to work for yeah. an hour a day, that would make me feel really anxious because I am a person who just can't sit still and I don't like the feeling of not being productive, I guess. And I think Ashley can relate to yes. that. I think a lot of people can relate to that, especially in this culture where there's very much overwork. Yeah, overwork, exactly. So how did you cope with that? I think it was having the support system that I had. It was like my mom, my dad, and my friend, my husband, that was my friend at the time, having them there and my other friends, like they wanted me to get better. They wanted me to take care of myself. And they, all of them know that I am a bit stubborn and I like to feel needed. I like to work. <laughs> so yeah, of course it was really hard. And that's why it took me, Another reason it took me so long to feel like myself, because that's a huge part of me that I just lost. It was just pushing through and having the support system is what helped. I just have to say that I feel like it really does take so much courage to surrender control and allow yourself to get better and take care of yourself when it's not what you want to do. And I feel like that's something that people might not be able to understand or relate to until they experience it because it sounds like, oh, it should be so easy. People are telling you you can't work. So like that would be so amazing. And you just like have this excuse at least for my personality and it sounds like for your personality that's the opposite of easy and so I just think that's really admirable that you were able to do that. Yeah I agree and I think that it's also um, really speaks to how important it is to have a support system around you. And it helped that I was more I listened to my body as well and that's a huge thing that needs to be done. So like when I was in the hospital they wanted to give me medication and I didn't want it because I wanted to know what my body could do. I know that if I would have taken medication, I would have overdone it and hurt myself in the long run. And the same with I did a lot of physical therapy and started doing yoga. And these those things changed it for me because I was actually able to do so much more when I got in a routine of doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really important point as well. So then jumping ahead a little bit into COVID, obviously there was no travel during that time. And I'm sure that was really difficult to not be able to pursue your passion. And I know you talked a little bit about focusing more on hikes in Sweden and the local nature. And can you just talk about how you made that transition and how you kind of dealt with the overwhelm? I definitely kind of put a halt with my travel blog when COVID happened. So I kind of reevaluated myself and thought, what am I going to do? What is going to happen now? I actually started going to a university and I'm still studying to become an English teacher. And then I'm also learning Spanish. <laughs> so I'm pretty busy. <laughs> And then now I'm still doing my travel blog a lot more now. That's amazing. I think that is just really great that you turn something bad into mm -hmm. a way to 
try something new and pursue a new passion. So what's next on your travel bucket list? The dream trip is uh, to live in Japan for a year with my family. Oh, wow. Have you been to Japan before? Nope, not yet. Well, we have a couple questions that we always like to ask all of our guests at the end. But before we get to those, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about or share with our listeners? I think I just have a tip and that would be stay positive. I mean, there's a lot of obstacles in life that happen. However, if you live in that, how are you going to get better? How are you going to move forward? So that's why I stay positive. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Our next question it was going to be if you have a favorite inspirational quote. So I don't know if it's that or if you have another favorite quote that you would want to share with our listeners. That would have to be slow and steady wins the race. When I was healing from my accident, we went on a hike, my first hike after my accident. We went to Yosemite National Park. And we did one of the big hikes there. And I was in so much pain trying to go up that hill that I told my husband and my dog, like, oh, go forward. It's okay. I'll I'll end up catching up. And like I was in tears and just kept going. And so I had that mantra going on. Slow and steady wins the race. I made it to the top. And oh, my gosh, that was the best ever. This hike, I think, was supposed to take, I don't, I can't remember, four hours or something. And it took it took me 12 hours to do or something because I had to keep taking breaks and stopping. Well, that's incredible that you kept going and that you did the whole thing. Um, the last question that we ask all of our guests since our podcast is to inspiration is if you could have an identical twin, would you want one? Oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe there are times probably, but other times. I don't know because of all the things I hear about twins, like how they can kind of read each other a little bit more and all these other things. I don't know if I would want another person in my mind. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. We get annoyed with each other sometimes when she'll say the exact same thing as me. And I'm like, let me think for myself. Stop being so much like me. But we love each other. Speak for yourself. (laughs) Just kidding. I love you. I know. Well, thank you again so much for doing this. It was really great getting to hear your story, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice meeting you guys. Nice meeting you too. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah.